You're saving for a rainy day, but it's not even wet. Then there's food, some gas, and clothes. Don't forget the rent. Insurance pops up here and there. And don't forget to cut your hair. You need new shoes, but you got the blues because you just ran out of cash. Welcome to another episode of Sensible Chat, the podcast committed to helping you learn positive money mindsets, destroy debt, reduce financial stress, and break the paycheck to paycheck cycle. Our guest professor today is Dawn Starks, author of Simplify Your Financial Life. She's going to share a multitude of ideas for doing just that. And after class, Sensible Bobby has some food for thought as she displays the budget buffet. So let's not waste any more time and get right to the siren of savings. The boss of budgeting, the darling of dollars, here is Sensible Bobby. Thanks, Scott. And thank you for joining me for another episode of Sensible Chat. Ah, budgets. Some people have a love-hate relationship with them. If you've listened to more than one episode of this podcast, you're probably aware that I absolutely love them. But even for me, it was overwhelming in the beginning. Why? Because getting started is a big task. There's a lot to do, a lot to find, and a lot of different places to go to find what you're looking for. Such is the case in many areas of our financial lives. So it's no wonder we put things off. You can almost see this big mountain of stuff staring at you, daring you to dive in, knowing that the pile that looks so big is actually hiding a gaping hole you could fall into and spend a long time digging yourself out of. Doesn't sound like my idea of a fun afternoon. Well, guess what? You don't have to accomplish it all in one afternoon. And the big pile you're staring at is made up of a bunch of little things. So if you take one little thing at a time and don't look at the huge pile, that big mountain will turn into a small hill faster than you ever thought possible. You've just got to start. But why are we doing this in the first place? The mountain is so big, why not just leave it alone and go do something fun? Because our finances impact every part of our lives. So the more we turn our back on the mountain, the larger it grows and the more it causes stress and unhappiness. We need to tear down that mountain and then put some systems in place that make our lives much simpler going forward so that we never, ever again face this daunting task. But where do we start and how can we simplify our financial lives? I found a money Sherpa to show us the way. Sharpen your pencils and grab some wood because Sensible University is now in session. Today's guest professor is Don Starks, author of Simplify Your Financial Life. Don is a certified financial planner, financial advisor, minimalist, and creator of the Simple Money Club. Don's mission is, and has always been, to make financial concepts easier to grasp and less intimidating. Don, thanks so much for being our guest professor today. Thank you for having me. I'd like to read a quote from your book before we start. Quote, simplifying our lives is not a one and done. It's a process and a lifestyle we choose to adopt going forward. Simplifying our finances is no different. End quote. I think this is important because when you start this process, the to-do list may seem a bit overwhelming. What are your thoughts? Oh, I think it's totally true. I'm really interested in simplicity and minimalism. And I mean, it's been a 20-year journey for me. So I've been a financial planner for over 20 years, and I've been simplifying for over 20 years. And I don't want people to think that, wow, it's just never ending, but it kind of is never ending. I think that as new challenges come up and as new stuff enters our life, it's important for us to stay on top of making sure we're buying things you know, based on our values and not just accumulating junk. And then the same thing with our finances. If you don't pay attention to your financial life for some period of time, it's going to kind of go to seed and you're going to have to kind of rein it back in and get things organized all over again. And the more you let things pile up, the longer they just take in general, right? I mean, you know, if you like a kid leaves a bunch of clothes out and it's going to take them 20 minutes to put them away as opposed to just putting away one thing at a time. Exactly. It multiplies. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) it can get to be very overwhelming. And I know when I first started my journey, like the first day, you know, I spent like three or four hours doing what I was doing, just trying to get everything together. And, you know, there were some days when I felt like, gosh, this is a really long process. But then, you know, (laughs) several years later, it takes no time at all. So it can be a little overwhelming getting started, but it goes shorter and shorter as time goes on. Is that right? 
It does. And I think that, you know, letting it go and letting it pile up, whether it's laundry or it's your financial tasks or whatever it is in your life, that breeds procrastination because you just start to look at that heaping pile of whatever it is that is just getting larger and larger. And it makes you feel paralyzed, like you just can't move forward. And so it's really important. I think I'm a big proponent of breaking things down into really, really small steps in order to make forward progress. So while we're on that subject, let's talk about money dates. What are they and how can they simplify our financial lives? Well, that's a good segue from talking about the piling up of the tasks. I like to encourage people to make a date with yourself. Or if you're in a committed relationship and you work on your finances with your spouse or partner, make a date with your spouse or partner and have a regular time that you sit down and address your money tasks and your money issues. Because if you set it up and you honor that date and you treat it like an appointment, just like you would any other appointment, like going to the dentist or to the doctor, if you honor that and keep that, you can build momentum and improve your financial life simply because you are conscious of it on a regular interval. So that doesn't mean that it has to be every week. If you're starting out and just really trying to get yourself together, then maybe having it every week is a good idea. But once you kind of get in the groove and you know how your bill paying routine works and you know about you know checking over your investments and all the various pieces of your financial life, you might decide that twice a month is enough. So just having that date and honoring that date and keeping it like an appointment, putting it on your calendar and giving yourself reminders and looking forward to it as opposed to dreading it. Those, I think, are the key components. And I encourage people, you know, try to make it enjoyable because a lot of people equate dealing with their finances or paying bills with like going to the dentist, something horrible that nobody wants to do. But if instead you put on your favorite music or, you know, you pour yourself your favorite beverage and you set aside this time and you designate a specific place that you're going to work on your financial life and you gather tools that make you happy, you know, if you like highlighters, use highlighters, you know, whatever can kind of get you into a, a more positive frame of mind for doing it. And then it becomes more of a pleasurable thing rather than, oh my God, I have another money day <laughs> deal with my money. Right. And so we've just talked about, you know, doing it even if you're by yourself and not married yet. But chapter 12 in your book is a great point that doesn't get talked about a lot. And the title is Marry Carefully. And I think this is very important considering that money is the leading cause of divorce. So what do you mean by marry carefully and how can this simplify our financial lives? Well, thanks for asking. It's one of my most favorite things to talk about. And yet I always want to tread lightly because I can certainly speak from my own experience to say that, you know, marrying somebody who was very opposite to me in terms of our finances has been a challenge. That said, I'm not implying that everybody should go out and try to find a mate that is exactly the same as you, because as we know, opposites attract. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that you need to make sure that as you are getting into a relationship that you view may be permanent, that you are, in essence, checking out your partner financially. You need to know what are their values. Are you in alignment with your life values and what you want out of this life? And are you on the same page in terms of what your opinion is about carrying debt and saving and sort of kind of the biggies. You don't have to be in perfect alignment, but you do have to understand where the other person is coming from with regard to their financial life and how they think about money. Because just having those conversations initially, even if you have differences of opinion, that will open the door to having good quality conversation as your relationship progresses, as opposed to being two individuals doing your own thing, living your own values, and never talking about these things. And then those problems will fester. Yeah. And it comes as quite a shock to some people. I mean, there's so many of us who, you know, got married and thought of certain things, you know, maybe they're on the same page about having kids, or maybe they're on the same page about where they want to be in 10 years in their life, their career or whatever. But a lot of times you don't think about how, you know, financially compatible you are. And you just kind of tend to assume that, you know, your significant other is on the same page because, of course, it makes perfect sense to you. So why would anybody else, you know, think differently? And then when it comes right down to a major decision, it can be a big shock. And, you know, you kind of find yourself going, wow, I guess we should have uh, 
you know, talked about this before. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, it happened to me. I'm a lesson here (laughs) because I was in graduate school and I studied in business and in finance. And as I got out of that and became a financial planner and started working as a financial planner, that's when I met and then ultimately married my husband. And I did not spend the time on the front end really understanding how he thought about money. So I'm not suggesting that I don't think I would have married him had I known, but I do think our lives would have had a better trajectory in terms of getting along when it came to making money decisions. Because I just sort of assumed that he felt the same way about things I did. And I didn't take note of some of the warning signs that would have led me to think, Oh, wait a minute, maybe we should talk about this before we get married and merge our lives together. So it's an important topic for me because I feel like that has caused our marriage to be much more challenging than maybe it might have been if we had been a little bit more careful on the front end to get those cards out on the table. And kind of along that same path, you know, we hear a lot of importance about goal setting. But in the book, you point out that prioritizing is just as essential. And I think this is another thing, you know, on that line, especially if you're working with somebody else is making sure that priorities are matching. So tell me why prioritizing is so essential, especially when it comes to goal setting. I'm a major goal setter. I mean, I've always, I can't even remember a time when I wasn't, didn't have like a 10 page, not I'm exaggerating, but you know, like a 10 item or more goal list because I'm just goal oriented. Not everybody is. But even if you don't physically sit down and think about and write out your goals or state them in some fashion, most people have things they want to do in their life. You know, they want to get a certain job, they want to make a certain amount of money, they want to own a home, they want to own a particular type of car. So those are goals, whether you actually say, this is my goal, or you don't. And why I talk about prioritizing is because so often I think people get into this notion that, hey, I'm going to try to work towards all these things at one time. And with your money in particular, you know, your money only goes, you can only spend it once. You can't spend it three or four times. So having goals is great. And then sitting down either with yourself on your money date or with your partner and talking through each other's goals and saying, okay, well, what are our priorities? What is the thing we really need to focus on first? Because it's that focus that's going to get it done. And it's that in the case of a partnership, it's that mutual focus on one particular goal and getting it done that's going to make it happen. Otherwise, what happens is you spread yourself too thin. So likewise, you know, non-financially, if you're trying to you know, lose weight and exercise and eat right and do all these various things, if you focus on one of those things and get it rock solid before you move on to other things, you'll have better success than sort of scattering your efforts across lots of different things. I agree 100%. When I was trying to pay off debt before I started reading about personal finance and really figured out how to do it in a good way, I was spreading myself thin, trying to pay extra on top of everything and feeling like I was just never going to get anywhere. And it wasn't until I focused in on one, you know, that's kind of the debt snowball thing that I really started getting somewhere. So you're right. It is so much more effective. I mean, you've got to have goals, but that prioritizing is completely essential. Yes. Now, I thought it was interesting in your book, you talked about the Keyring app, and I've never heard about this before, but I love the idea of it. And I think it's a really good way to simplify our financial life. Can you share what the Keyring app is for? I will. And I don't have any connection with them. So (laughs) this is just me as a raving fan of Keyring. And so I should also say, uh, by way of disclaimer, that I am so analog. I love paper and I love writing things. And so for me to take a leap into something technological is kind of a big deal. (laughs) So when I found the Keyring app, I was really impressed, but I was nervous about it too. And the premise is you are scanning in the barcodes for all of your... like The courtesy cards you have at grocery stores or places where you get discounts and whatnot. It could be your library card. You know, A lot of these cards you carry around in your wallet, or sometimes people put the little version on their actual physical key ring. And so you scan those barcodes in. You can also take a picture of the front and the back of the card so that the app actually asks you to do that for posterity, (laughs) to take a picture of it. And by doing that, you're storing all of those things in your phone and having it with you digitally rather than having to carry around all those cards in your wallet. So when I finally decided to take this leap 
it made a huge dent in my wallet because you can do gift cards and other things too. Not credit cards because usually you have to stick those in or swipe. But anything that's just really a card that you use for getting discounts or that sort of thing, membership cards, you can put into the Keyring app. And so that really streamlined my wallet a lot. I had a little stack. It was probably about maybe three quarters of an inch tall of all these cards I was able to pull out. But then I put a rubber band around them and stuck it in my drawer and kept it for like a year (laughs) because I was worried that this wouldn't work. And then I was going to not have my cards anymore. So it was really helpful. So now when I go to the drugstore and I need to pull out my loyalty card or the grocery store, I can just pull up this app and tap on it. And then it shows the barcode. You can scan it right in and it, it works great. Yeah, I'm with you. I I would have kept my cards for a year too because I never trust that stuff to work right. But by the same token, like you said, it does clean up your wallet. And I love the idea because, you know, I've had these rewards cards and they get shoved into my wallet and I'm not really sure where they are because I don't use them all the time. So when it comes time to use them, I either forget that I even have one for where I am or I just don't feel like trying to dig it out while I'm standing in line, you know? And so this is such a great way of having that convenience and still being able to get the discount because come on, I mean, if you can get a discount, why not? You know? Well, exactly. And we're usually scrolling our phones anyway while we're standing in line. So now you can just pull the app up and scroll and find your card for that vendor. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a great idea. Another thing that I found really great in your book was the financial docket. Tell me what this is and why it's important. The financial docket is really just an organizing concept. So I don't really have a specific idea of what it would look like because I I envisioned that everybody's docket would look different. I have this dream that one of these days I'm going to create something that could be an app for people to use. But the premise is using some sort of list or organizational system to keep your financial life on track. So most people pretty much get the idea that, hey, if you have bills that are due every month, they're due every month. And at some point during the month, you have to sit down and pay your bills, whether you're doing that online or physically writing checks or going online and transferring the money, or if you have things drafted digitally right out of your accounts, whatever the case may be, it's something that happens routinely. So I encourage people that as you start adding things to your financial life, you're adding things to your docket of things to do for your financial life. So in addition to bill paying, it might be checking on insurance claims, or it might be checking on your investments, or it might be reviewing your insurance. And these are things that don't necessarily happen monthly. They may happen quarterly or semi-annually or annually, or maybe every few years. So there are things that as you start to pull these things into your understanding of what you have to do in order to keep your financial life on track long term, you're creating this tool that will keep you organized so that you'll know month to month, hey, this month I'm due to do my insurance review. Or this month, I'm due to call and make sure that our estate planning documents are up to date or you know, so on and so forth. So it's more than just paying your bills on time. It's making sure you're remembering all those other pieces of your financial life. Yeah, that's a very good point. And if you ever do get that app out, I definitely will stand in line to get it. Because <laughs> that's a fantastic <laughs> thing. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, that's, I mean, at least from the standpoint of, of the bills that aren't due monthly, that's the biggest reason I see a lot of people failing when they are first trying to budget because they're only thinking about what's right in front of them that month. And, you know, the things that come up through the year or maybe two years from now or whatever, they're just off the radar because they're not done, you know, all the time. And those are the things that tripped me up at first, too. So having a way to get those organized is really important. And of course, you know, we all have calendars now and phones and everything, but it'd just be nice if there was one central place for everything financial. <laughs> that would definitely yeah, be and I just here. encourage people to make a list because, yeah. you know, the things that don't get done are the things that we don't pay attention to. And so you might consider yourself a person who's really on top of things financially because you never pay a bill late because you pay everything on time, but your portfolio might be a mess. You might have accounts in four different places because you worked at four different employers that had retirement plans. You know, you might have bank accounts in old towns you lived in previously and so on. And so really starting, that's really the mission of the book is to start noticing all these pieces that are loose and out there and let's start getting them organized and consolidated and simplified and creating those systems getting yourself organized in order to have regular review so that you pay attention to the things that are important. 
And like you talked about paper and pen, I mean, that's as great a way as any, you know, and lists are great. And computers have file folders and kind of you can set up your own filing system in there. So definitely very important to get all of that in place. Set up a process and trust the process. Now, you have a chapter in your book on decluttering your budget. Let's talk about how to declutter the budget and why that's important. For me, decluttering is a big theme in my life. I think people who are interested in simple living and minimalism, they think a lot about decluttering. But most times they think about that with just their physical belongings. So they think about, oh, gosh, this closet, it's, you know, I can't even get the door closed. I got to get rid of some of these clothes and shoes and things. And they think about getting rid of things that they don't need anymore or that don't fit anymore or just are no longer in some way useful to them or their household. But I encourage people to also think about their budget that way, because oftentimes we get into a rut, especially now when everything you can set it up on automatic payment or subscriptions or or whatnot. And you get into this rut of just going through and having your credit card bill come every month and you pay it. Hopefully you're paying it every month and you're not really reviewing it. You lose track of what are you actually spending your money on. Or you're just going and buying groceries in the regular way and you're going and spending in the regular way that you have always done. And you, there's a real lack of mindfulness about it. And so I encourage people to be more mindful and to periodically look at their budget. And by budget, it could just mean look at what you're spending. Look at your credit card statements. Look at your bank statements if you pay with your debit card. And actually go through on a regular basis and see what are you spending your money on? And take a look at what those things are and what do they mean to you. I encourage people to think about the value that those purchases are bringing to you because you really want your spending to be in alignment with your values. You want to get away from that mindless spending where you're just spending just because you just have always done so. And so bringing that mindfulness in and looking at your budget and saying, what of these things are no longer serving me or us? as a household. What are these expenses have we outgrown and we just want to get rid of them? We don't need to have them anymore. But we just haven't noticed because we've not been paying attention. And that leads into another topic in your book that I loved. And that is don't ignore the hidden cost of your stuff. And I think this is so often overlooked and it took me forever to start thinking this way. So give me some examples of the hidden cost of stuff and how they can complicate our finances. Well, I'm not going to drag my husband in to make an example of him, but (laughs) but I could because he's a person that likes vehicles, he likes gear and that sort of thing. And so that's one of my favorite examples because if you buy a car, you're not just buying a car. You're also buying the need to put gas in the car every week. You're buying the maintenance that goes into the car. You're buying any upgrades you might want to do to the car. So there are all these extra things like insurance for the car. So there's all these sort of peripheral expenses that go along with the cost of the car. And so cars are easy to make an example of because there are obvious additional costs. But there are other things. Carrying so much stuff around with us in our homes requires a bigger home. So think about if you could eliminate half of the junk that you just have in closets and in your attic and your garage, you potentially don't even need the amount of space that you have. So you're actually carrying a higher cost of housing because of the stuff that you own. And when you think about making a purchase like a car, I encourage people to look beyond the initial cost of the car. The easy thing to look at first is, of course, do you have to finance this purchase? If you have to finance it, then obviously beside the cost of the car is going to be the cost of financing it, the interest that you're going to pay to carry it. But then there's also the insurance and the maintenance and whatnot. And so when people are thinking about one car versus another, you can compare sort of the entire carrying cost of each vehicle rather than just focusing on the price tag of each vehicle. Yeah, I think that's really important, obviously, for the reasons that you've already mentioned, but also because sometimes we tend to look at the price tag and say, okay, this is the cheapest thing that I can find. So that's the best deal. But if you take into consideration, I mean, if you are buying an older car, you have to take into consideration what kind of repair costs on what kind of basis are you going to incur? And is that really going to be a better deal than buying something that's newer that might be a bigger price tag up front, but not cost you so much of maintenance. So it's not just about the price of what you're buying. Exactly. And that sort of leads into this notion of buying quality versus 
not buying quality. You know, sometimes people will buy less quality items because they are only focusing on the cost of the item, like you mentioned. And sometimes it pays to actually spend a little bit more on the front end because of the life of that product, that it will last longer potentially than the cheaper item. So it's really just being, again, it's that mindfulness. It's really looking at a purchase and saying, okay, what is this really going to cost me? And don't forget also the other hidden cost is your time. What's it going to cost me to maintain this thing that I'm buying now? You know, if you go and buy a, you know, fancy quality leather sofa, I don't really know what I'm talking about. I don't own one. So. <laughs> but, but if you do that, then, you know, what's going to be involved? Are you going to have to spend an hour a month taking care of that leather and cleaning it in a certain way and so on? So it's really just looking past the initial purchase and saying, okay, what's it going to take for me to keep this item in good shape and in good function so that I'm not wasting my money? Yeah. And I think it's really important that you talk about both sides of that because the idea here is that there's no right answer for anything, right? I mean, there's no one answer for anything. It depends on you. It depends on the different things in your life. But the idea is not to have the right answer. The idea is to know how to think it through to make the best answer for you. Exactly. And that goes back to that values. You know, is it in line with your values? Maybe you have always wanted a fine leather sofa. (laughs) And you are totally into the idea that you're going to have to condition that leather and take care of it. Totally fine. It's not a value judgment by me or anyone. It's saying, is this thing that I'm buying, am I just buying it because everyone else has one? Am I buying it in order to keep up with the Joneses? Am I buying it because I'm not paying attention and I'm just trying to solve some other problem, an emotional problem that I'm having right now, and I'm shopping to sort of smooth that over? Why am I buying this? And is it in line with the way I want to be living my life? Now, let's talk quickly about auditing our subscriptions and services, because I think this is a great way for any of us to simplify our financial lives, but something we don't really think about a lot. Yes, this kind of runs along with the idea of decluttering our budgets, but taking a look at those services and subscriptions that end up going on autopilot. So you might have a a home phone where you have different services on it. Fewer people have that now, but sometimes people have their cell phones now that have different features and whatnot. And you may be paying extra for those things. So just like anything else, when I'm talking to people about examining their budget, you're kind of digging in and saying, you know, do I really need that? Am I using that? You know, if I'm signed up for serious radio, am I really listening to it in the car or am I always listening to audiobooks or podcasts? You know, looking at those with a real fresh eye and sort of taking a step back and saying, okay, what is this really doing for us? Is this service or product that we get on a subscription basis, is it really serving us? Because I think that, you know, it's easy. And easy is good for a lot of things, but sometimes easy also makes us complacent and it makes us not do the work of actually examining, am I wasting money here or is this really serving us? Yeah. Question everything. I've seen that written and I think that's such a great idea. You know, after reading your book, I think one of the easiest ways to simplify our financial lives is to truly adopt the spend now, pay later mindset, which you talked a little bit about a few minutes ago. But would you agree with that? And can you kind of expound on that mindset? Yes. I think actually what you mean is the save now, spend later, because spending now, pay later, we don't want to adopt that mindset because that's the mindset that's gotten us into trouble. I You're think. Right. Is, yeah. I meant is, the yeah. You just, yeah. That's okay. You just twisted it because spending now and paying later is a very pervasive philosophy now in our society. And if you go back a couple generations, there was no such thing. They didn't have credit cards. They didn't have credit, period, or very, very minor access to credit. And they had to save for what they wanted. And I think a lot of people today are like, Oh, that's just such an old antiquated idea, you know, and it's just so much easier. Now we can just use our credit card and pay for things now. But really, if we can take a step back from that and be more careful about how we're spending our money, it would truly do us all a bit of good to work towards saving for something rather than spending our money now, and then paying it off over time. This is how people get into trouble with credit card debt because they want the thing now. They can't live without the thing now. And therefore, they end up paying for it with interest. And so it becomes much more costly over some period of time. 
And so they're still paying for that item oftentimes months and months and potentially years after that item that they had to have has lost value, has lost interest. They've lost it literally. You know, it's just gone yeah. um, and they're still paying for it. Yeah. Talk about a way to simplify your financial life. I mean, if we didn't have debt, we would obviously think more ahead of time about what we spend because we wouldn't have the choice to just mindlessly spend beyond what we had. There wouldn't be the stress that came with knowing that you're in debt, the stress that came with paying all these different bills and all these different credit cards and keeping track of everything. And oh, certainly that is a great way to simplify your financial life. Just uh, don't spend what you don't have. Right. Yes, exactly. And I mean, it, it, you know, I think people think, oh, well, that's just sounds so quaint, but it's just not practical. But it really is. I'm not down on credit cards. Credit cards are useful tools and they do really simplify our lives in a lot of ways if you use them appropriately. It's using credit cards in order to use the credit on those cards that's the problem. So if you use them like a charge card, and you pay it off every month, then it's really a great tool. It can help you be organized. It can help streamline your record keeping. There's a whole host of reasons that it's easy and helpful. But it's that carrying the debt that becomes the problem because then it's a crutch. And then it's just easy. It's easy to use and it's easy to spend when you don't have the money. And you don't really have a rock solid plan for getting the money in order to pay for those debts. Yeah, I completely agree with you. You know, money is just, I mean, it's an inanimate object, right? And all of the tools we have are not good or bad. They're not detrimental or saviors. It's what you do with every tool. And that comes back to you and how you decide to use it. So exactly. Now, I know that we're uh, out of time here, but I just, I have to ask you this because I love this quote in your book, embrace your inner tortoise. Can you share what you mean by that? (laughs) <laughs> yes, like so many things in life, you know, good things take time and getting to where you are successful with your finances, especially if you feel like you have a long way to go. I mean, if you feel like you've really dug yourself a hole or you just never have felt like you had enough financial knowledge to be successful with your money, you may feel like it's a really long journey in order to get to what you would define as financial success. So I encourage people to just embrace that tortoise, embrace the fact that, hey, it's going to be a slow... And sometimes it's a slog, right? It's going to be a slow journey to get there. But by embracing it as opposed to fighting it, then you're going to appreciate the journey along the way as well as getting to the destination. Too often, just like with the consumer culture where it's buy now, pay later, just like that, people, it's like have now, have now, don't worry about later, you know, you want it now. And so everybody wants things immediately. And so there's this sort of lack of delayed gratification. And so it causes people to really get frustrated and give up. So they start on a journey of trying to improve their financial life, just like they might start on a journey to improve their health by exercising and eating right. And they don't see results within the first few days or weeks or even months. And so then they give it up and they think, oh, this is just not worth it. I'm not getting anywhere with this. Being successful with your financial life really does take time. And you're just going to have to accept that. So the sooner you accept it and then just lay the groundwork and start working on your plan the better off you'll be because then suddenly, you know, five, 10 years go by and you're like, wow, I got all my debt paid off. And look, I've got a 401k that I've got X dollars saved in it. And I've got my emergency fund saved up. And so all of a sudden you can look back and see that you've made real and good progress. But along the way, it can feel so, so slow. It's like you just described my journey. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Several years. Yeah, because sometimes it did feel, gosh, am I ever going to get anywhere? And it's so slow. And then now I look back, wow, you know, and I talk to my husband, look at all that we've accomplished. This is so great. And like I've said lately on, on this podcast, the time is going to pass anyway. So yeah. regardless of whether you use it to try to get yourself in a better place or decide to give up because it's too hard, you know, we're all getting older. The time's going to pass. So we might as well make the best of it. That's right. And I don't encourage people to ignore what you're doing, but there is some benefit to just working out your plan. If it's a debt payoff plan or if it's an investing for some goal plan, you know, you create what the plan is and start working the plan and then just put your head down and work the plan and stop paying attention to the, you know, the milestones along the way. It can be okay to look at those milestones along the way if that helps you and encourages you and motivates you to keep going. But by the same token, if you know you're going to get there, then just keep your head down and work because otherwise three months in you look and you're like, wow, I've hardly made a dent. And then you get frustrated and quit. And I just, I hate that for people. So I say, just start investing your money and then just ignore it. Just let it go. And you will see it compound over time. 
Yeah, sometimes the best thing you can do is look away. <laughs> look away yeah. for a while. Like nine negligence or something like that is what yeah. it's called, I think. <laughs> well, Don, I love this book and there's so much that we didn't get to, but you know, I really want to encourage everybody to go and get a copy of your book because I loved it. I think it has a lot of great ideas on how to simplify our financial lives, which is such a huge thing, especially right now. So how can people get the book and get more information about you? Thank you. Thanks for your kind words about my book. So you can find me on my main website, simplemoneypro.com. And that's my blog and I have a podcast and uh, you can get to the book from that site also. And then there's also a site for the book that's just simplifyyourfinancialife.com. So simplemoneypro.com and then simplifyyourfinancialife.com. Great. And what's the name of your podcast? The Simple Money Podcast. The Simple Money Podcast. Okay, so everybody go and check those out. And we're going to put links to those in the show notes for this episode as well. Dawn, thank you so much for all your time today. I really appreciate it and all your great information and the book. We look forward to chatting with you again. Thank you so much. A great big sensible thank you to our guest professor, Dawn Starks, author of Simplify Your Financial Life and host of the Simple Money Podcast. You can get her book and listen to the podcast at simplemoneypro.com. Dawn has a plethora of great ideas in her book. And if you want to simplify your financial life, join the club. Literally, she just launched her Simple Money Club. You can get all the details at simplemoneypro.com. You'll also find a link in the show notes for this episode at sensiblechat.com. Dawn talked about decluttering your budget from the standpoint of how you're spending. Now let's talk about how to declutter the process of budgeting. If you've spent any amount of time learning about budgeting, you know there are many schools of thought on how to do it, and they all have their place as far as ideas go, but they don't all have a place in your budgeting process. Budgeting is not about following a list of rules so you can say you're doing the right thing. After all, the right thing for you may not be the right thing for someone else. Budgeting is a tool a process for making life less stressful and helping you achieve your goals so you can live the life you want. So what do you want? Let's think of it as a buffet. At a buffet, there's an assortment of great food to choose from. It's not all going to appeal to you, and you certainly can't eat it all, so you have to choose what you want most. If you're trying to lose weight, you may choose the healthier options. If you're craving comfort food, your choices are going to be different. You may prefer a certain kind of dipping sauce or ice cream topping while someone else wants it just the way it is. None of this is right or wrong. It's about personal preference and what works best for you. It's the same with your budget. So I want to introduce you to a new idea, the budget buffet. This buffet is made up of various budgeting methods, including zero-based, the 50-20-30 method, the 60% solution, the no-budget budget, the list goes on and on. Each has its benefits and drawbacks. Zero-based budgeting works great for me. I love everything about it. Others swear by a different method. And then there are those who take pieces of several different methods and create a unique system that fits them best. Why? Because we all think differently, we all learn differently, and we all have different goals. Don't let anyone tell you that their way is the only way. It needs to fit your life and your goals because the best budget in the world doesn't work unless you work it. And I don't know about you, but for me, I don't really learn how to use anything unless I understand why I'm doing it. What's the benefit? I mean, why would you keep doing something blindly if you couldn't see the benefit? Plus, when you don't understand it, you feel intimidated by it, afraid to screw it up and shy away from using it out of fear. So it has to be deeper than just following the steps someone laid out for you. It has to be a method that helps you achieve your goals in a way that makes sense to you and something you know you can stick to. If having a lot of cash on hand makes you tempted to overspend, even when it's separated for different things, then the cash envelope method probably won't work for you. Conversely, if you tend to overspend when using your credit or debit card, cash envelopes might be the best thing. Check the show notes for this episode for an article link that outlines several different budgeting methods. Try them out. See what works and what doesn't. There's more in this budgeting buffet than just the specific method you choose, because there are many other choices to make. One question I get a lot is, what should my categories be and how many should I have? 
They're sometimes frustrated when I say that all depends on you. But it's true. Take clothing, for example. If you feel you buy too many shoes, then a separate category might be good so you can rein in your spending. If that's not you, create a wardrobe category instead, which covers everything you wear. I used to have a car maintenance category as well as a savings category for my next car. But I recently merged them into one because any money I don't spend on car repairs for my current car will be used to buy my next car. So I see no reason to keep them separate. Some people have one category for all household bills. I have a category for each bill because it stresses me if I can't see that they're all covered individually. If I kept all the money in one category, I'd constantly be doing the math to make sure there was enough to cover everything. Whatever works best for you, it's completely personal. If your categories are overwhelming and stressing you out, ask yourself why you need that category. What purpose does it serve? If there's no good reason for it, get rid of it. And if you find out you were wrong, you can always add it back in. Another big question is, should you work toward multiple goals at once? For instance, the great debate, save or pay off debt? Again, a personal choice. I chose to pay off debt first, then save. Many say you should do both at once, and still others say save first, then pay off debt. Who's right? Wrong question. What's right for you? That's the question. Paying off debt first is going to save you the most in interest, and then you'll have more money to save. But if you can't sleep at night without a savings account, then save first, at least until you get to a peaceful amount. This is all about making life better for you. So no matter what someone else says, you have to check your own gut for the right answer. The bottom line is your budgeting process needs to serve your purpose and allow you to sleep peacefully at night. So if that means you don't hit your goal as fast as the next person or you spend a bit more than you had to, so be it. Part of the budgeting process is prioritizing. And if you know your priorities, these answers will come pretty easily if you take the time to think it through. And just because you feel one way today doesn't mean it won't change tomorrow. That's okay too. For the longest time, I've been against automation, but I'm starting to come around. I've come to automation in moderation. If you're confident you'll consistently have money in your account when that automated payment hits, and you're confident that you'll remember to track that payment, automation may be the way to go. But if you're not on top of your finances, automation can do more harm than good. Personally, I'm still on the fence with it because I like to be able to pay my bills and track them all at one time, right when my paycheck hits. But this week, I learned that if I sign up for auto bill pay for my cell phone, I'll save $15 a month. (laughs) sign me up. I know for sure I'll always have enough in my account to cover that payment when it hits, and I'm confident in tracking the payment each month, so I'll take the savings. Now here's another decision I had to make. I use my credit card to pay for everything because I get 2% cash back on every purchase and pay off my entire balance each time I get paid. But my cell phone company won't give me the $15 discount if I use my credit card. So which is it? 2% cash back for the purchase, or a $15 discount. And this is why I do the math. In my situation, the 2% cash back is way less than the $15 discount, so it's a no-brainer. But if I hadn't been thinking about it in those terms, I could have easily said no to the monthly discount so I didn't lose my cash back rewards. Question everything. These are just a few items within the huge budget buffet that awaits you. There's no one in line behind you, So take your time to look around and see what looks good to you. Do some taste tests and see what you like. You can always go back for seconds and throw away the items that may not taste as good on your plate as they looked in the serving dish. If you want someone to go through line with you, provide feedback about your options, and help you put together a delicious plate, reach out to me. I'd love to help. Also, let me know what you like best on the budget buffet. What's working for you and what's not? In the meantime, remember, budgeting is not hard. It's just math. Changing your mindset is the challenge. But if you're ready to take control of your financial life, you might find it a bit easier to change your mindset and live the life you dream of. So until next time, remember, do the math, live the life. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Sensible Chat. 
All the links and resources mentioned are in the show notes at sensiblechat.com. That's sensible with a C. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. To schedule your free budget consultation, click on the book a free call button in the upper right-hand corner at sensiblechat.com. Have a question or success story? Or how about a great budgeting idea? Sensible Bobby loves it all and wants to hear from you. Go to sensiblechat.com for all the contact information. That's sensible with a C. 